630. It looks like we have about 12 people um, mm -hmm. listening to us. So why don't we go ahead and get started? I uh, okay. want to welcome, welcome everybody to our little uh, Aging in Place webinar here. Um, I would like uh, my two panelists to introduce themselves. We'll start with Florence because she's in the top of my window here. So Florence, tell us who you are, what you do, and, and a little bit about yourself. Hello, my name is Florence McCauley. I am a certified aging in place specialist and the founder of Agewise Home. Agewise Home is a consulting company that offers aging in place and concierge services to the elderly, people with disabilities and veterans. Um, our goal and our mission is to make sure that when elderly people decide to age in place that they can do it safely and we give them strategies and a process in order to make sure they are thinking about aging in place before it becomes an urgent need. Uh, so we offer um, home safety assessments, home modifications with a great team member, Andrew, with Beautiful Home Services. And we wanna make sure we give them a very compre comprehensive approach to Asian in place, so it's not a stressful process. Excellent, thank you. Uh, next, Jan, please tell us who yeah. you are. Hi, everybody. Hi. I'm I'm Jan Brito, CEO of Brito Associates of Compass. We have a small real estate team of six folks based out of our Chevy Chase office. My business partner Laura Quigley is is a participant or an attendee here as well. Uh, we specialize in the senior market um, in helping seniors and their families go through a period of transition where they're deciding, should they age in place? Should they sell the house? Should they move to independent living? Do they need assisted living? Do they need continuing care? And which one do they choose? Um, we offer a complete turnkey service, um, such as helping to declutter the home, helping with estate sales, helping donate anything that's not wanted by the family, getting the house on the market and getting it sold. It's our passion and we love it. And we get great satisfaction of helping people through this major transition in their lives and their families. Awesome. Excellent. I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Andrew Blate. I'm the co-owner of Beautiful Home Services. I see my business partner, Craig, has joined us as well on, as a uh, participant. Uh, we are a full service uh, home improvement company in the Maryland, Virginia, DC metro area. We specialize in um, bathrooms, basements, kitchens, painting, drywall, flooring, uh, what we call your sort of minor renovation. So taking out walls, adding walls, expanding doorways, uh, your general renovations. We're not a, uh, a complete general contractor. We don't do additions. We don't modify the exterior of homes. We really specialize on the inside of the home and uh, different renovations that can be done within there. So in that- Can I give you a plug, Andrew? What's that? Please, please. <laughs> Andrew worked with me on a, um, a woman in her 90s who went into assisted living. Her condo, she was the original over owner of her condo, and it was, I don't know, 50, or 50 years old or so. We completely mm -hmm. gutted the condo and renovated it with the help of Beautiful Home Services and were able to net her twice as much as she would have otherwise to uh, aid awesome. in her in paying for her care. Awesome. So it was wonderful experience. Can I clap for that? Yeah. <laughs> yes, right. yes. It was good. It was, uh, it was a great program. And we used, um, we used a, a service that um, Jan's brokerage Compass uh, offers called Compass Concierge, where uh, it, mm -hmm. it didn't require really very much out of pocket. No, money. none out of pocket. No, no yeah. money out of pocket. That's right. And it, it. Um, it really helped her out. So um, good. So our, our, uh, our goal here tonight is to discuss aging in place, to discuss home modifications, to discuss what if the house that I'm living in or my family member uh, is living in is not gonna work anymore and we need to move to some other location. Um, and I have some questions I'm gonna ask and I encourage any of the attendees who have questions, please put them in the chat box or the question box and we will gladly answer them as we go along. So um, I'm going to ask uh, Florence, First yeah. question is, what is aging in place? What does that mean? I love that question because it actually has a very specific definition that's defined by the CDC. And they say it's the ability to live in one's own home and community safely, independently, and comfortably 
regardless of age, income, or ability level. And I love that definition because it's very holistic. It encompasses everything that's needed. People, when they age in place, that doesn't mean you're gonna stay in your home forever. So you have to think about your home being accessible and also the community that you live in. That's, that's a good definition. Um, yeah. <laughs> how do you, what does that mean like in actual application? What does that look like? You were just saying before we got started that you spent your whole day driving around you know, meeting with people, what does that look like in your day-to-day -day life? What is the conversation you're having with people? So it, uh, Asian in place is very specific to the client, um, but it really just depends on what their need is at that point. There are some people who are just physically not able to function in their home safely. So it really starts with just an assessment and a conversation of what does Asian in place mean to you? who's living with you, or what support do you have, what services that you need to, in order to safely maintain your home. So after the home assessment, it's really saying, okay, what can we do for you within your budget, within the needs, or what's important to you and your family? So it's really just specific because I have one client who just says, I just don't want to live in the dining room because they because they were unable to access the stairs anymore they just put a hospital bed in the dining room I don't want to live in my dining room anymore so let's find a way to honor those requests but find a safe option for this person to live and safely enjoy the home that they built wow 50 60 years ago right um so yeah it really means a lot of different things to a lot of people but it's all about just enjoying your home that you've worked so hard for and I think that that story kind of dovetails into my question for Jan. So let's say we reach that point where the house is not livable uh, for the condition or potentially looking forward and saying, hey, in X number of years, I don't think this house is going to be livable for me. Let's plan ahead now. I know you're, you're a senior housing professional. What does that mean? Well, um, I have special training in dealing with folks uh, of a mature age. Um, mm -hmm. Many folks have heard about the senior real estate specialist designation that NAR, National Association of Realtors, has endorsed and has been out there for probably decades. Um, I am now working on an advanced level designation, which really delves more deeply into some of the emotions and um, mental aspects of dealing with folks in this situation, as well as their families, because it is a very emotional experience for folks to go through. In many cases, we're dealing with children of parents who have moved on, you know, just are deceased, or maybe it's not a voluntary move into a memory care facility, for instance, there's a lot of factors in play here. And so we're trained, especially to deal with all of those situations, and uh, to be respectful as well of um, the, the control that the seniors want to maintain to the degree that they're able to, that's so important to them. I mean, even a little thing like rearranging furniture in their house, like Florence said, they get used to where a piece of furniture is. You can't just come in and stage it and move things so that they fall when they get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, for instance. That's a really- You have to be very, point. very conscious of, of all of these factors. Very that's, strategic a, of everything. that's an excellent point. So in that, in that same vein, if we are gonna modify the house, what does home modification mean? What are, what are we talking about here, Florence? So home modification really is, is to reduce the barriers in the home for safety and to increase accessibility. And sometimes on just a very minimal level, it's about changing the lighting, rearranging the furniture to increase the walkways in the home, um, putting down, securing area rugs to the floor to reduce the risk of a fall, um, adding night lights um, so that um, there's always illumination within the home. Or it can be like, you know, you helped me do it, a, an awesome thorough estimate for really redoing a home that will, a bathroom that was poorly done a year ago so that we can actually do a modification in a bathroom that's going to age with the person. Our function and our, our cognition and our function changes with some people. So you have to make the adjustments that are needed for them today and then 10 years from now. So it really just depends. And I think that dovetails into a question that uh, my business partner, Craig, just just posted up. You know, how, Jan, how does, how do you marry uh, modifying a home to age in place and also the resale value of that property? Well, it could certainly affect the resale value depending on the degree of the modifications. So we might be in a position where we need to undo those modifications to add value back to the home. 
but hopefully they've got enough equity at that point that, that we've got the money to make that happen. And using some of the tools I can provide, it makes it a lighter lift on the family. So can we do it the other way around? Could a home modification actually increase the value of a property? It depends on the modification. Maybe right. like expanding a bathroom or, mm -hmm. you know, making a nice walk-in shower. I know that Florence and I have discussed on a couple of occasions that, and I know something that age, uh, that AgeWise Homes, her company does, is try to marry those two of like, let's modify the home to be safe while also either maintaining value, possibly increasing value, certainly not turning it into looking like a nursing home or a hospital if we can avoid it, right? Correct. Okay. Correct. Because it's, it's also just thinking about aging in place, I've always been taught, starts at birth. We make adjustments for when we have children, you make adjustments if someone gets in a car accident, and it's trying to be proactive so you're not just putting up grab bars because that's what they need now. So if you create accessibility with style and function, you're able to avoid that look of a hospital because you're just adding accessibility, which everyone can benefit from. Mm -hmm. Right especially Jan when she turns around to sell the house and we don't have to spend thousands of dollars undoing everything. So. Removing all the grab yeah. bars. <laughs> exactly. So, so exactly. Jan, that, that leads to a good question. So what factors do you take into consideration when you're advising a client um, regarding senior housing versus home modification? Well, it's totally going to depend on their wishes. Honestly, if they feel very strongly that they would like to try to age in place, I have to respect that sure. and point them to professionals like Florence who can help them. Um, and you know, at some point they will need me, but if aging mm -hmm. in place is their desire, then I am all about helping them achieve that. What if they're, what if I come to you and say, Jan, look, I, I could stay in my home. I could in, invest some money to modify it, but there's also these great senior living facilities. Give me a couple pro cons that you go through with your, with your clients. If they're sort of on the fence, they can't make the decision. Well, I think I'd have a conversation with them and find out what it is, what it is they enjoy at this stage in their life. For instance, would they like to be able to socialize with other folks their age? Would they like to be able to go on field trips where they don't have to drive? Um, if, if they're interested in that sort of environment, I might suggest a few different communities that they could visit just to see what, what it's like and what's offered. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there are some people who would rather stay home and read a book in their comfortable living room in front of the fireplace. Yes. You know, it all depends on what their needs are. And like I said, uh, we've, we tour regularly communities that are out there as well as new communities that are being built. So we're up to speed with what's available and we can let them know about different options that are out there. Florence, same question to you, but maybe from a different angle. How do you approach that conversation with a patient or a client, I guess would be about whether it's right for them to stay in their home or um, possibly go to another living situation? How do you, how do you broach that conversation? Um, it's a tough conversation because it's all about their function and their cognition. If you are able to walk from your bed to the bathroom outside the door um, without, with limited assistance and a de decreased risk of fall, and you're cognitively sound, that increases the, the that increases the likelihood that you'll be able to age in place safely if you're living with an elderly spouse or if you're living by yourself. But we come into the situation is, are you gonna forget that you left the stove on? Are you eating expired foods? Are you taking care of yourself? Are you bathing on a regular basis? If there were an emergency, would you be able to get out of your home safely? So all of those questions will determine the safety that they have. And sometimes um, some clients are not as aware of their own deficits. So you have to bring that to their attention. And sometimes it's a really hard conversation to have. Sounds challenging. Uh, it is. I got a good question here, also from Craig. Uh, he says, when looking for a house that I want to age in place later in, what features are best to look for? I think that's a, a pretty insightful question. I mean, you know, yes. folks my age are possibly upgrading from their starter homes to potentially their forever home. Mm -hmm. And that forever right. home could be a long time. So that's a question for both of you. What features should somebody maybe in their 40s or their 50s who are buying their forever home be looking in now? 
I would say for my aspect at the bare minimum, um, try to have as the least amount of stairs to enter your home as possible and a first floor setup. Because if you say, if you, even if it's a temporary injury where you were, you got in a car accident and you weren't able to use one of your legs, if you only have four steps to enter with a, with two, with a rail on both sides, you can get into that home. And then if you have a first floor setup, meaning you have um, a, a full bathroom, a bedroom, and hopefully like the kitchen on that level, that's all the space that you need and you need to function with. So I would say at the bare minimum for my aspect, if you are able to have a first floor setup and the least amount of stairs to enter with two rails, then that'd be the best start. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree with France, uh, Florence. Um, a, a Rambler, for instance, a single level home, maybe with a basement, um, is, is preferable because there are no stairs. Now, I don't know that that would meet everyone's needs because depending on the square footage they're interested in. And, and another thing is the owner suite on the main level, just yeah. as Florence mm -hmm. said, so that eliminates the, needs, the need to deal with steps. Um, you, steps to enter the home is a big deal. Um, obviously, um, going up, if you have no driveway, no, no garage and your street parking and going up 25 steps to get to the front door, that's not going to work in 25 years for you, perhaps. Problematic, so. right. I would say from a renovation standpoint, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of older homes, but there's a line there where you get older homes that have really small bathrooms, like the, the challenge mm -hmm. that Florence and I have in this home, beautiful home in, in DC that was built in 1950 something. And all the hallways are narrow. The stairwell is narrow. The bathrooms are tiny. There's nowhere to expand the bathroom. So you also look at it from a renovation standpoint. Is there, maybe the house right now isn't set up to have a main level owner suite or, or to, to accommodate a full bathroom, but is it able to be renovated to that point? Mm -hmm. You know, can we add that? Do we have a half bath and a big old closet next to it that I can take out and turn that into a nice big old bathroom or the master bathroom? Is the master bathroom large enough to accommodate a barrier free shower and also, you know, space for somebody to help you if you needed help? So sometimes it looks at the age of the home as well. Uh, there's a sweet spot in there. You know, some of the newer homes come, a lot of newer homes I see, I know Jan, you see this more than I do, you know, having an, a, a master or a main level suite is sort of like a standard, you know, feature now or, or, or something that is offered in a lot of new homes. Is that right? Yeah, many builders are, are featuring uh, owner suites on the main level and, it, and one above as well. Uh, right. Mm -hmm. For, you know, multi-generational families right. who yes. bring the parents with them. It's mm -hmm. important to have that main level uh, owner suite. Yeah, that's... Uh, on the rise. That was a that was a good uh, good question. Um, we have a question from one of the. Uh, yeah, we do. I was just looking at that there. So it says. That's a question for you, Andrew. Yeah, it is. It says, <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you ever recommend installing an elevator chair on the stairs? Stair lifts, chair lifts, yeah, stair lifts. That's for you, Florence. I, I just had some removed from a house that was moved no. out of by seniors. Yes, I have to say. I'm not a fan of it. I would definitely recommend a first floor setup because I've actually had clients trip over the bar that's used in order to get it all the way down the stairs. So it becomes a barrier. Yeah. So I would always recommend a first floor setup if it is at all possible. Um, but I have a lot of people who have chair lifts and a chair lift, when you think about it in case of an emergency, it doesn't have a button that makes it go faster. <laughs> it if you're, if you're at a point where you had it five years ago and you just can't safely get into it now and someone has to lift you into it. So it has, it, it has a shelf life um, and it's not always able to be installed depending on the size of the home, the width of the stairway. So I just feel like I would exhaust every option before I put in a chairlift. You know, the, the home we saw the other day, Florence, you know, my concern there, I was thinking about it when we were walking in there, that that chairlift was so tight in that stairwell. If that person was upstairs and had a medical emergency that required the fire department to come and get them out on a stretcher, it would be hard yeah, enough yeah. to get a stretcher down that stairwell to begin with. Right. How narrow it is. And now you've got a thing that blocking two thirds of the stairwell. I, I could see that as a potentially a, a dangerous situation. You know. Andrew, yeah. back to Craig's question about uh, what should you look for if you want to age in place later. 
Um, if you have the means, you might consider looking for uh, like a townhouse with an elevator, even a single family house with an elevator, mm -hmm. or the possibility of adding one at some point later if there's a closet yes. or a, you know, a space for that. That's right. That's a, a, that easier, a common feature. Was that? Yes. No, they're a lot easier. Um, I, I've done a couple of courses and one of those biggest things were, you know, the installation of elevators in the home, which, you know, when we think about an elevator, we think about, oh my gosh, you have an elevator in your home <laughs> as this very like high budget um, ticket item, which it isn't because there's a lot of different elevators that you can place in the home. But depending on the structure of the home and the how the closets line up, that actually might be a better option. Um, than a stair lift. And I, and I don't know, Jan, would an elevator in someone's home be considered something that would pique someone's interest in a good way or would it? Yeah, be no, that, that would be a value add for sure. Yeah. So that's yeah. a modification we could make to a home and add value at the same time. Yes. I mean, I have senior clients moving from big single family homes into town homes with elevators. They right. don't, mm -hmm. you know, they don't want to be in a single level necessarily, but they don't want to deal with the stairs. So exactly. that's a, that's an excellent Excellent question there, an excellent, uh, and, and certainly adding a chairlift does not add any value to your to your home, right? No. <laughs> so <it'll be> <laughs> I, we've taken them out a number of times and they, they depending on how they're installed, they can really mess up the walls. We, uh, and if, yeah, and if they're, the if they're installed on carpeted stairs, for instance, then the carpets, you have to redo everything. Uh, everything has to be everything. redone. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So I have another question for, for Florence, and this kind of continues on this, this direction, the conversation. I said, what approach do you take when evaluating a home and a patient's needs? What is, what is the approach? I know you talked first, you have a conversation with the, with the, with the, um, you know, with the homeowner, with the person, but then what, do you, what approach do you take after that? Like sort of how, to, how, about, how about I rephrase it like this? How do you walk through the home and what are you looking for to determine whether you're aging in place or potentially going to a different facility? So that's exactly what I was going to say. I actually walk through the home as if, if I have to enter, okay, let's see how they would enter the home, how they would move around the home. How do you, how far is it to get to the bathroom? How far is it to get to the bedroom? Where do they sleep? In a case of an emergency, how would they exit the home? So I literally just walk through the home the way the person would if they're in a wheelchair or a walker to get a good sense of any barriers that might they might have in the home. Um, there's things that people just, well, it's always been there, but does it need to be there? So it's right. really just trying to focus on thinking about how the person is navigating this home with any functional um, issues that they might have, and then try to see at every step that I go through, how can I make this better and re remove any barriers that there might be? Is there a limit to the number of barriers where you're like, look, there's five, 10, 15 barriers between you and food or you and the bathroom or you and your bed or whatever, and that's just, just too many to overcome? It's, there is, because we have to think, why are we working so hard? Um, at this age, or even, at, even if you're not older, but you have a decreased level of function, we have to work smart, not hard, because it's all about the case of an emergency. If you cannot leave your home at, at, a, at, a speed, at a increased speed to get yourself out safely, then are you even safe being in the home? So sometimes it just becomes a point where, okay, we're trying to do too much right now. It might just be safer for you to talk to someone like Jan, or do we need to discuss looking at different um, options? Do you need to go to a memory care unit? Do you need to go to a, um, an assisted living? Do you need to go to a CCRC? They're just diff there are a lot of options when it's no longer just safe to be in the home. And especially if you live in the home by yourself. What are a couple of the, the like, give me the top three that are like deal breakers. Like if this is a barrier that we can't overcome, it's, it's a non-starter. What are, what are a couple of the top ones? Um, I definitely say too many stairs to enter the home. Um, I would also say um, if there isn't a first floor setup, and if you do live at home, if there's someone who, if you do not have a designated person to check on you throughout the day, right. those would be my things. Lawrence, I have a question for you. That's got to be a difficult conversation to have with someone who would, had their heart set on aging in place to find out their home couldn't be sufficiently modified. Um, do you, 
bring in a mental health professional to help you deal with that? Or are you able to deal with that yourself? So it, it's an ongoing conversation. It is a conversation that I said does not happen in one day. Yeah. Um, I have a client now where I've been talking about the transition out of home for probably about a month now. So it's little bits and pieces. And my goal is for them to arrive at the decision themselves and me just give them the best information to make the best decision for themselves. Because I'll get a text, well, will I be able to hang out to go to my same church? There's no reason why you couldn't. We'll just find some place that's closer to your church so that the people that would pick you up from home can also pick you up from wherever you live to go, go to church so that they don't lose that, that normalcy that they had. But it's not an easy conversation to have. I have difficult conversations with my parents every week. So yes. <laughs> uh, Andrew, there's so a question. Yeah, I was just about to ask. There was a question there about installing, installing exterior elevators. So I can say confidently in 20 years in the industry and roughly 15,000 estimates, I don't think I've ever seen a residential exterior elevator. I a wouldn't lift? say it's out of the realm of possibility. I guess you could do it. I think you would run into issues of one, how it would look, two, stability on the ground, mm -hmm. three, how you actually access the house because you'd need to, you know, potentially punch one or two holes into the exterior of the house, which gets into some load bearing stuff. So that's not something that I've ever seen, but I don't see why it wouldn't be possible. Um, I think you'd have to, to get the right elevator company for that. Uh, Florence, have you ever seen that? Have you ever seen an exterior elevator? I have, but no, it's more of a wheelchair lift. A wheelchair lift. And the right. wheelchair, yeah. So a lot of times from the car to the actual front door, it's not an even, um, it's not one level. So you have I to go up a couple saying. stairs to get to the home, the home so that there is an elevator lift, um, elevator lift, there's a wheelchair lift where a person can actually stand or sit in a wheelchair right. use or walk or lift them up to the next level. Yeah, so I have that seen that. Yeah. yeah, but not an elevator per se. Somebody mentioned in the chat that uh, they've seen uh, garden apartments in Florida. Uh, many people have those. Yeah. And Laura mm -hmm. mentioned that she has clients doing that right now, an exterior elevator. Laura, I would love to see how that works. Yes. If it's more than just a chair lift, if it's an actual elevator, I would I would absolutely love to see how that, uh, that, that work works out. So, um, but as somebody else brought up a good point. What do you do in the event of a power failure? True. Yeah. I guess you'd have to want to have some kind of backup power that at least yes. that elevator so you could at least get out of it or function it properly. So, mm -hmm. uh, we had another, mm -hmm. um, another comment here from Tracy he says, I work in a senior community providing Medicaid personal care in the client's home. Do you all run into issues where seniors need care in their homes? Love the aging in place definition. Um, every day, <laughs> every, every day. day, every day. And okay. I think one of the things that I think is so terrifying is we don't have enough professionals going into the home to lay eyes on people. I have a client who lives by himself, barely. Um, cannot get out of the apartment, um, doesn't sufficiently eat because he cannot stand for a certain amount of time to be able to pr prepare meals, has difficulty um, bathing and dressing himself. I've just told him, I said, you need someone to be in this home. His children are out of the country. You need someone to come in this home and check on you. Because he's a high fall risk, if he doesn't keep his cell phone on him, he could literally be on that floor for days at a time without mm. anyone knowing. So I see it every day. I think that's probably the most frightening things of my job because if you don't have the family support, you don't have um, the community support, you are someone who's left to your own devices. And if your own devices are not strong enough, you could be in an unsafe um, situation at any moment. You know, that's a, a situation that I've discussed with folks when I come in and, and do the renovation side is okay, we can make this bathroom big enough for you to get into it, but how do we also fit a caretaker in? We actually did a job for a client where the one of the spouses got hurt trying to take care of the other spouse because 
the space wasn't big enough. The bathroom wasn't big enough for both of them. And she tripped and fell and, and got injured as well. And now you got two people who are hurt. So mm -hmm. that's another thing to think about when you're doing a, at least from my standpoint, you're doing home modification. It's not, can you get your wheelchair through or your walker or what have you through the doorway into the bathroom, but can somebody come and help you in the bathroom? Yeah, you know, that's a good point. And that could be something as simple as which way the door swings, right? A lot of bathrooms, mm -hmm. the door swings into the bathroom. So if you're in the bathroom and somebody else is in the bathroom, or if you fell in the bathroom and are blocking the door from opening, yes. how are we getting to you? Right? You know, we're seeing more and more barn doors these days, Andrew. Is that an option for people to make it easier to get in and out to Absolutely. replace the typical I door with a barn, barn door? door. And there's significant people than doing a pocket door. You know, with a pocket door, I have to take the wall down, build a hollow wall and put a door into it. And sometimes there's not enough space for that. Sometimes, especially in a bathroom, you're gonna run into plumbing or electrical and it becomes a whole big issue. We can take that door off the hinges and put a barn door in, no problem. We can also I take the door off and turn it around so that it opens out into the room versus mm -hmm. out into the other room versus into the bathroom, which is also a relatively inexpensive, usually easy way to, to solve that problem. Yeah. So there's a question that's very interesting in the chat now, and I, I don't know if this would warrant Florence, you recommending or suggesting that they consider not aging in place because of it. How do you adjust, um, how do you adjust with older homes with narrow hallways that can't accommodate wheelchairs? Mm. So there are different types of wheelchairs, depending on the size of the person and what their level of mobility is. There's a standard wheelchair where you have the wheels on the outside of the wheelchair where the person who's sitting in it can propel it themselves. Or you have what we call a transport wheelchair, which is a lot more narrow. And there's just small wheels in the back and the front where you're actually just getting pushed. If someone is able to facilitate movement with their legs alone, that gives them a, a, a better option of just using a transport wheelchair. But a standard, a standard wheelchair with the wheels on the outside, and then you also have to think about accommodating their arms using the wheelchair, it's really hard. It's really hard. And then, I mean, again, it depends on the mobility of the person. There's rollators, there's, wheel, there's walkers that actually have a seat on it, which is called a rollator. And sometimes, people just sit on it and then just use, we call it the Flintstone, they just use their feet to get around. And those are like, that's like the worst case scenario, but a transport, a transport wheelchair would be my second best option and recommendation for that. Again, your older homes, they have very narrow hallways a lot of times, or, you know, situations where you have to turn in a sharp 90 degree Mm -hmm. turn, which is hard to do in a narrow hallway with a wheelchair or a walker for that matter. You yes. Know. So, and that's, that's not something that's easily renovated out. I mean, you, mm -hmm. it's, if you're looking at expanding all of your hallway widths, we're, we're talking about, I mean, I'll do anything you want me to do if you wanted to pay me to do it, but um, <laughs> that, that's a, that's a situation where I might bring in Jan to have a conversation that this might not be the right place for you any longer if that's what you need to do is to move your hallways so uh, one of our participants brought up a good point um referring back to the question about what do you do in the event of a power outage when you have um elevators mm -hmm. in, inside or outside the house and he said he believes that all of it elevators have a safety mechanism mm -hmm. that allow them yes. to go up that go down to the lowest floor once under control and safely in the event of a power outage that's interesting right. yeah mm -hmm. that's right so that's the that's good. That's good right there. What else? What else do we have here? So Jan, let's let's change direction a little bit and and talk about senior the senior housing industry. What trends are you seeing in the industry of late? Is there anything new? Um, yeah, a lot of the newer communities are offering all levels of care. So you can start at independent yeah. living, move into assisted, and then even into memory care. And uh, there are communities that offer sort of a concierge butler sort of service. So we toured one recently in Potomac that it was amazing the, the level of service they'll provide for you. They'll walk your dog if you, if you, oh, right. you know, buy Can into the, kids? Can I bring the butler kids? service. Um, you want to move in. I, yes. <laughs> no, I said reserve a spot for me. <laughs> so yes, yeah, with so. our business, they're called CCRCs, Community Care Retirement Communities. So their, their whole approach is aging in place because you start out with the independent living, the assisted living, and then you have the skilled nursing facility and options for memory care. 
And I used to be a director of rehab at a CCRC right in Northwest DC. And the beautiful thing about it was you do have a spouse, they have a fall in independent living. If they need to go to rehab after a, a surgery, they can actually stay on the same campus get the rehab that they need and then end up going back home. And it's just such a beautiful thing because with the fall, it's so traumatic for the elderly and it changes them a bit. So to have some level of normalcy, it's always a benefit. And I've tried to move into that one Northwest, but I'm not old enough and I can't afford it. So um, <laughs> yeah, they're nice. I mean, they had a happy hour every night. Yeah. They have five star They have chef a lot of fun in those meal. places. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I think it would be a good situation, you know, also for the spouse. So if you're in the same facility as your spouse, as opposed to them having to go to a hospital or a nursing home, and then you have to figure out how to go visit them and that logistics there, I bet it's a little less traumatic on the relationship, I would imagine, right? Mm -hmm. yes. uh, somebody's asking about the cost of the communities. Well, they vary greatly from, you know, one yeah. to the other, depending on um, their level of service and uh, whether or not they're, you actually purchase a unit in, in the community mm -hmm. or if it's a rental sort of situation where you pay a monthly fee to get all your services combined. So they vary greatly. Um, and you know what we recommend to clients would be based on their preference for those types of services and, and, what, and also uh, the affordability for each person. Now, uh, here's another trend for you, Andrew. In the last year, everybody's had to, there's that word, pivot to virtual entertainment yeah. and classes for these communities because these are people who, you know, not all of them want to sit in their room. They want to come down to the common areas and talk to people and watch TV and play cards and games and can't always do that. So there's a lot of things being done via Zoom. Art classes, for instance, uh, I know one community does those regularly, lecture series, et cetera. So back to cost for a second, what would be a, give me a range from a, for, for your nicer facilities, maybe not the, the Ritz Carlton of senior living and not the, whatever the opposite of the Ritz Carlton is somewhere in the middle. What, what kind of range would you be looking at in, you know, the DC area? Well, that's a tough question to answer because it depends on if you're going to buy your, your room outright or get into a situation where, it's, where there's a buy-in involved and then a monthly fee that you pay. It's really too broad a question to answer, quite frankly. I, I'm not trying to dodge it. There's just such a range. I don't know. That's, a, that's a good answer to it. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to ask a question myself as far as, as trends that I'm seeing in remodeling. I'm seeing a ton of people, I kind of alluded to this earlier, uh, my age, which is, will put me somewhere between my late 30s and early 40s, and <laughs> that are asking these questions now when they're purchasing homes of, you know, can I live here longer? And more applicable to me, they're asking me that of when they're doing a remodel. A, a big percentage of our business is, is uh, bathroom remodeling is about 40% mm -hmm. of our business, give or take. And when we're making new showers for people, everybody wants an enormous shower right now. One of the top questions I get is, can I make this a curb-free, barrier-free mm -hmm. shower, you know, a roll-in, roll-out shower? First of all, because they look really nice. But people are asking me, people in their 30s are saying, I plan on living here forever. Or mom and dad or grandma or somebody else is coming, potentially come to live with us. If I'm going to renovate this thing, I want to renovate it now so that it'll last through that period of time and I don't have to re-renovate it. And I think that's interesting because, again, I've been in the industry for a few minutes and that has really only started, I think, in the last maybe four to five years. Um, when we first started with bathrooms, I rarely got anybody who said, hey, can you build me a shower with no curb or no barrier in it? Right. And now who it's even knew about it? basis. What's that? Who even knew about it? or who even knew about it, right? And I'm not really yes. sure where that, that's coming from, whether that's coming from that they're seeing it on television, on HGTV or whatnot, or whether that it's real life situations where they're seeing mom or grandma or whomever in these situations and are saying, well, I don't wanna be here you know, in 30 or 40 years when it's, when it's my turn to start aging in place. So I think that that's an interesting trend in, in my industry, something that mm -hmm. my, a lot of my colleagues are not, not talking about, frankly. Um, mm -hmm that we talk about within our company of, of how to, to build these bathrooms in, a, in an accessible manner. So that's kind of interesting. But I, I think 
well, in our industry, you have more people, it's more, more multi-generational living and it, you have to accommodate the toddler that lives with you and also the person who might be in their 70s or 80s. I have a granddad who was 100 years old. If he can't do it, it then I feel like it's not, it's not anything that I need to do. If he can't come into any home that I'm either looking at purchasing or I think about him of just navigating any home a friend wants to purchase. It's like, okay, if my hundred year old granddad would have difficulty doing this, let's think about how we need to change it and just maybe adjust or find another home um, as an option. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's a, that's a good point. We, my wife and I moved a couple of years ago and, you know, my mom's a widow. My, my brother lives in North Carolina. So it, in that situation, it was not our first thought, but it was our house has a, an in-law suite in the basement that is accessible without any stairs from the outside of the house and has a kitchen and it has a bathroom and it has two bedrooms. And that was definitely a big selling point for us when we were looking at the property it was like, hey, look, if, if my mom or, or my wife's you know family needed to come here, it's ready to go. It's all set up. That was definitely a big selling factor for us. Uh, I think we have another question in the chat here you're thinking ahead and that's the aging in place is thinking ahead yeah. so it depends so the question is do you prefer a linear drain or a center drain so for those of you who don't know the difference a center drain is your normal drain that you have in a shower or a tub it's a square or a uh, a circle usually in the middle or on one side a linear drain is exactly that it's a long thin drain mm -hmm. sort of like if you imagine a pool where the water overflows the side of the pool um if we're doing a, uh, a curbless shower, so a shower that has no curb or a barrier to step over, we normally do a linear drain and that's gonna help mm -hmm. keep some of the water out. Uh, the, the considerations when we're building a shower like that is, is width. We won't do them generally under 36 inches wide. So if you're 30 or, or 28, the problem there is that the water almost, no matter what you do, drain or no drain, water is gonna get out of the shower. Now you can waterproof the floor and you can do some things to prevent that. But if we're talking about slipping and falling, you know, water on the floor is definitely a consideration that we don't want to have. So width is, is important. Um, and we generally will do the linear drain to, um, you know, reduce the water that's coming out. Plus they look really cool. So there's yeah. some style, style points in there too. If we're going to put some yes. grab bars in, <laughs> but we have a really cool linear drain and the shower looks neat. Jan is, is less upset about us for, for resale value. So <laughs> I'm going to have to look that up and see what a linear drain looks like. So if you look oh, at there, the, yes. if you look the pictures on the ad, um, uh, for the for our event tonight on the Facebook page, there's one of the showers has a linear drain. The one that has the uh, the chair in it, the white chair, that's a linear drain. Okay. Um, so that's a that's a pretty good question. Linear drains can't be put in all applications. I mean, they can, but they can require a significant modification. For example, if the bathroom is on concrete, you've got to dig the linear drain out of the concrete. So that can be a challenge um, or expensive. The If it is a more modern home that is, you know, standard stick built, it's a lot easier to do a linear drain. So. Ooh, good to know. Yeah. Other trends we're seeing, lots of handhelds in showers. And I have people who say, look, I don't plan on using this handheld, but at some point, you know, we might have mom or dad living with us and we want to be able to use the handheld in the shower, right? Um, we do a lot of the recessed boxes in the walls. Some people call them niches. That's popular just from a style standpoint, but it's also popular because it gets stuff off the floor of the shower. Mm -hmm. um, I would say our number one request for bathroom remodeling, regardless of aging in place or not, is turning tubs into showers. You know, a lot of your older mm -hmm. homes, every bathroom has a tub and I can take what is a 12 or an 18 inch step that you have to get over the edge of the tub and turn it into two or three or four inches, a little curb that you just have to step over. That could be something that's very easy for somebody to navigate versus stepping into a tub. And then tubs a lot of times are slippery and there's not actually a lot of square footage in the tub because you have the tub itself that takes up a lot of space. Mm -hmm. So I can take that tub out and in that same footprint of the tub, put in a shower that feels like it's twice as big as the tub was. So it's, that's an easy modification. Are you getting requests for shower benches as well? Tons, tons okay. of benches. Yeah. And there are some really nice, good looking fold down benches that we can put down. Really? That, oh yeah. Yeah. That, that are like teak, that are stainless mm -hmm. steel, 
that are beautiful, that look really nice that you would have in, in any bathroom. And they can, if we're doing the bathroom from scratch, we threw bolt them into the studs. So you, me, and Florence could do the hokey pokey on it and it's not gonna fall down. Uh, and they look nice and they, and they, you know, they don't take up a lot of square footage because they fold up into the wall or, or you know, flush onto the wall. So it's not like building a true bench in that shower, which might make it difficult for somebody to bathe somebody else, right? We were talking about accessibility okay. for the caretaker. If there's a big old bench there, then you've taken up a lot of real estate where somebody needs to help. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's a problem with the home that we um, we looked at in Northwest where the bench was huge, but then it's like, was a bench to her height and her specifications and it was not. And you need something that has a little bit of adjustment um, for people to maximize uh, their own ability. So that's yes, that's there are a lot of nice benches. There's actually a whole website devoted to grab bars and benches that I frequent. It's <laughs> <laughs> function meets fabulous is, is always the key, but they're really nice ones out there. And I'm just I mean, so happy that they've done that now. That's something we talked about. How do I renovate this space? How do I modify this space with thinking about home value in the future or thinking about resale value or not making it appear to be a hospital or look like a hospital. And I think that that's a valid concern. You know, uh, we have a question here in the chat um, on the question and answers. Some of the contractors we've worked with in the past didn't have too many options for materials, which can be constraining if we are customizing for aging in place. Does BHS or age wives use a wide variety? Well, that just dovetails into what you were just talking about, Florence. Why don't you, why don't you tell us a little bit more about these fancy websites that you, that you frequent? <laughs> So part of my job to help my clients make the best decision is doing the research for the best supplies because tile, we all have tile, but there's tile that is less slippery, um, that's slip resistant and versus a porcelain versus a vinyl. And porcelain is one of the best tiles that you can use for flooring, especially when the floor is wet. So my job is to use all of the resources and to really understand how to navigate the web because it's vast to find the best products for my clients. And yes, not all products are created equal, but what is that? What does the person need specific to their um, functional needs? Do they have any visual, um, vision requirements or any limitations? You also want to take that into consideration. And of course, their budget. But my job is to make sure I go through everything that they would need. Part of the report that I um, put together after I do my assessment is say, these are the best supplies for the job that you need. And I give a high, medium, and low option just mm -hmm. so they understand what the market has. That's, that's excellent. We work with a number of, um, number of vendors that sell tile that have whole lines of tile that look like right out of, they're out of home, beautiful magazine, but are slip resistant, mm -hmm. you know, ceramic and porcelain to Florence's mm -hmm. point. Some of the new porcelain tiles now look identical to marble. I have a couple of bathrooms that we've done that you would not know that these that the, that the tile is not even touching it. It sort of feels like marble. It, it looks just like marble, but it's slip resistant. Uh, I know that one of our cabinet vendors, they have mocked up in their showroom, a whole um, wheelchair accessible kitchen, everything, the appliances, the cabinets, the sink. And it looks, if, if you didn't know what you were looking at, that it was different heights, if you weren't like cognizant of that, it, you would just look at it as a regular kitchen. It looks beautiful. It doesn't look like it's in a, you know, in a, in a facility. It looks like it's, again, right out of a magazine. This is a high-end cabinet showroom. Uh, so I think there's a lot of attention being paid within the remodeling industry from the material standpoint to the question to renovating spaces to be, um, you know, slip resistant, friendly for folks in a wheelchair who have accessibility issues while still looking really nice, you know. Yeah. We have another concern. question uh, regarding installing uh, heated flooring in bathrooms. Is that something you recommend for a senior or so would you recommend? Heated floors, the thing I always remind people about heated floor, the only complaint I've ever had from anybody about a heated floor is that the floor doesn't get hot. I had a client who got really upset with me one time because they were thinking that the floor would be like hot, like a hot stone massage. I'm like, I don't think you would really want that. That would be a safety issue. So heated floors are great for radiant heat flooring. So to add another heat source 
to the room. So if we were taking mm -hmm. out, like, let's say we were working in an older home, a row house in DC, for example, that has the radiators in it. Radiators take up a ton of space. They can be dangerous because they can get really, really hot, especially the old ones. We could take that out and put in radiant heat flooring to prevent the space from being too cold. Mm -hmm. And then you've solved your problem. It has to be installed correctly. It has to be waterproofed correctly. Otherwise you run into some issues. It has to be on a dedicated circuit so that if it if there is some kind of issue with the electrical, it just pops the breaker. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're relatively, for most houses, they're relatively easy to install and they're not super expensive. So Good to know. any issue with heated floors? Oh, there's another oh, no, question. Actually, Did they need oh, it was, it's one of those things that is um, always recommended because I think temperature control for the elderly is very important. So anti-scold fa faucets, um, sometimes um, in-wall heating units that can be um, turned on and off during a bath because they're so easy, their temperatures easily go hot and cold very um, quickly. So anything that can make them a lot warmer, especially during um, bath time is always something that is recommended. Yeah. yeah the nice do those heated floors need much maintenance, Andrew? I mean, do they, they need ever- need no maintenance. No? It's electrical. Mm -hmm. So the newer, newer ones are, they come in these mats that sort of hook together for layman's terms, like mm -hmm. a Lego set. And we, so we have your subfloor, you put that mat down and then you, you put usually a, a, a layer of another material like Duroc or something on top and then you lay the tile. Uh, there are a lot of them are, um, the newer models now have thermostats just like you'd have in your house that you can program. So if you know that you're getting up at six o'clock to take your shower in the morning, you can set it at 5.30 and it turns to 72 degrees and you walk in your bathroom and it's it's nice and warm. Uh, it's nice when you get out of that shower and that floor is not, you know, super uh. cold. You can step on it. Some of the um, other flooring options other than tile, like some of the LVT, luxury vinyl, luxury vinyl, or luxury plank, luxury vinyl plank floorings can also be used with heated floors as well. So you could have a, and some of those are really non-slip um, and are a, yeah. a lesser expensive option than, than tile in some cases. So you, not all of them, but some of them are rated to be used with a heated floor element as well. So to answer the question, usually once it's installed, there's no maintenance involved with it at all, so. And I guess it does help dry the floor faster, right? It does, I think a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the point of the heated towel rack is to dry it, right? But yeah. again, looking at it from a accessibility standpoint to Florence's point, and those some of those older homes, if I can take out a radiator and just have that not in the room to block access or potentially take that out to allow for a larger shower or a more accessible vanity or a bigger doorway, a heated floor is a great way to, to supplement the heat source in a safe manner, so. And there's some value in a heated floor in bathrooms. People do like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a new trend. Yeah. The, the technology, when we first started using them years ago, the, the mats were very temperamental because if you get, they're like Christmas lights. So if you get one break in the line, the whole, the whole section of the floor will stop working. Mm -hmm. And the reliability of the mats and the technology behind them and making them more foolproof and less easy to damage has come a long way just in the last probably 10 years. So we were for a while there, we were really hesitant at installing them uh, because of that, because they were, could be temperamental. But now the newer ones that we're installing, we don't have really any problems with them. So. Awesome. Yeah. I can, I can feel my wife saying like, why don't we have heated floors in our bathroom? Because <laughs> I didn't build our bathroom, so. <laughs> But you can modify it. I, I yes, can. you can. <laughs> I, have a, I have a very, uh, a very, very nicely large bathroom, which was a, a very much a qualification when we purchased our home. So, um, awesome. nice. so let's see. One of the questions, I think we pretty much covered a lot. Mm -hmm. um, did either of you all have anything else that we didn't cover tonight? Mm. I don't yeah. think so. We've been on about an hour, so i throw it yeah. to our attendees. If anybody else has any other questions that we didn't address, um, feel free to post them. Um, I think that it would be great if both of you posted your contact information in the chat, email, okay. website, um, whatnot. We have a question here. The contractor's house is... Oh, <laughs> 
So the quick uh-huh. story there is when we were mm-hmm. lucky enough to get into our first home, it was a fixer upper. And uh, I promised my wife we would never buy a fixer upper. And so we had the opportunity to buy a short sale that was very much a fixer upper. And uh, that's where we are now. So uh, I kind of lied on that one, but it's a nicer house. So we're, we're, we're bringing it along slowly. So um, appreciate everybody. So it was a, a question about a rerun. So this is also being broadcast live on Facebook. So if you go to the Beautiful Home Services page on Facebook, you should be able to access it. And we're also recording it. So we should be able to repost it um, on all of our social medias and probably on YouTube at some point in the near future. So um, I personally would like to thank Florence and Jan for taking an hour out of your um, Wednesday evening to join me for this. I think this was a lot of fun. You're very welcome. Thank you for for the idea. Thank you for the idea. This was great. I really appreciate it. Good. And I hope everybody has a wonderful evening and a good rest of your week. Thank you. You too. Bye, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for joining.